Now listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, Hardeep. Is now a good time for us to plan that computer programming lesson we've been assigned? Hey, Don. I was just thinking about that, actually. Yes, let's get it out of the way now, shall we? I've got the instructions here. So, it says, design a 45-minute lesson for a class of 16 teenagers where they learn how to write a simple computer program in BASIC. Now, I know, of course, that BASIC is the computer language people used to use back in the 1980s when they wrote programs on microcomputers, but I'm not sure I feel very comfortable teaching anyone about it. Well, I did a bit of research yesterday and found out quite a few things, so I think we'll be okay. Great. So, what do you have in mind? Well, I think we should presume that none of the kids will know anything about BASIC, so why don't we start with a short multiple-choice quiz? It could focus on things like what BASIC is, what the letters stand for, when people used it, things like that. That sounds good. I guess it shouldn't take long. Just the first five minutes of the lesson, something like that. I don't think we should make the students do it on their own, though. That'd make it too much like a test. Shall we let them do it in two so they can discuss their choices? Yes, good idea. Then we'll go through the answers with them as a whole group. Good. What next? Well, I've had an idea for the program they could write. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I think the key thing is, though, that before they actually sit at their computers, and I think we should presume that they're doing this lesson in a computer room, they make a flow chart of what they want the program to do. That's usually the best way to start writing a program. This flow chart will show all the different stages of the computer program, right? Exactly. It's probably best if the teacher stands at the board and everyone works on that together. Yes, otherwise they'll all come up with different flow charts and it'll get confusing. Precisely. I imagine making the flow chart will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Then they use that to write their computer program. Well, actually, I think there's a stage before that. You see, the flowchart will be in English. They're going to need to be taught a few basic commands so they can write their computer program. Hmm, now I'm getting out of my depth. What kind of thing would that be? Well, for example, when you want text to appear on the screen, the command is PRINT in capital letters followed by the text you want to appear in double inverted commas. Oh, yes. I think I've seen that before. Right. So they'll need to be taught five or six commands before they use them to write their program. Okay. So how shall we do that? With the teacher talking to the whole class again? Well, we could, but it might be more fun to make it more like a competition, where there are a few teams competing against each other. Each team has maybe four or five people in it, and they have to do some kind of matching task. You know, they match the command print with to make text appear on the screen, something like that. That sounds good. Teenagers love competing with each other. Exactly. And then, for the final part of the lesson, they use their flowchart and the commands they've learned to produce the program. Let's presume, shall we, that there are eight computers in the room. So that's two students for each computer. That sounds reasonable. So tell me more about your idea for the computer program they're going to write. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. OK, so it's a very simple program. I've actually written it down here so we can go through it together. OK, so the first line says 10 CLS. What on earth does that mean? Well, every line of a basic computer program starts with a number. They usually go up in tens. So the first line is 10, the second 20, and so on. And CLS is the command we use in BASIC to clear the screen. Oh, I see. So that's just telling the computer to start with a blank screen. Exactly. Then we move on to the next line. So this one says, 
20, print, guess a number between 1 and 10. Right, I see. That appears on the screen. It's not that difficult, is it, when you get the hang of it? Let's see if I can work out the next one. 30, input I. Oh, not sure about that. Well, all that's saying is that the person playing types in a number. Input is the basic command for type in, and I just means any number you like. Oh, okay. Then what happens next depends on what the number is. So we've got 40 if I is less than 1, or if I is greater than 10. Then print, bad choice. Right. So if they type, say, 0 or 11, that appears on the screen. Exactly. And then this next line takes them back to where it asks them to type in a number between 1 and 10. That's line 50. I see. And line 60 says, if I equals 6, then print. Correct. Ah, OK. So if they've typed 6, they've got it right. And if they haven't typed 6, which is the next line, then try again comes up on the screen, and that takes them back to where they choose another number. It's clever. Well done. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 14. The valley and estuary of the River Trelor forms an unspoiled, beautiful landscape rich in both wildlife and sites of historic interest. There are many ways to explore the area, and public transport links are good. It is possible to leave your car behind and travel by boat, train, or bus, with just short walks in between stops. The Trelore Valley Passenger Ferry runs between villages along the river estuary and provides a link with a train station at Barrie, which is about ten minutes' walk from the riverside village of Calton. In the past, the river was the main form of transport in the area, and as in the past, today's ferry service operates according to nature. The river estuary is tidal, and so the ferry timetable differs from day to day, according to the times and height of the tide. The ferry is also seasonal, normally running between April and September, depending on the weather. A timetable for the whole year can be downloaded from the Internet by visiting www.trelorferry.co.uk. If you just want to sit and relax and enjoy the lovely scenery, you can take a river cruise to Calton and back from the nearby city of Plymouth. In the past, steamships brought early tourists along the same route. Queen Victoria and her family enjoyed such a trip in 1856. The journey is quicker these days. The round trip takes between four and five hours, depending on tides and weather. If you prefer, you can travel upriver by boat and return to Plymouth by train. All cruise boats and trains have wheelchair access. For more information and for departure times, ring Plymouth Boat Cruises on 017-528-23104. Trains run several times a day throughout the year between Calton and Plymouth, with various stops in between. They are used by both local commuters and tourists who want to enjoy the beautiful scenery. The highlight of the journey is crossing the river on the stunning viaduct, which was built at the beginning of the 20th century, and towers 120 feet over the water. It is unnecessary to book, and tickets can be bought on the train. For information about fares and timetables, contact National Rail Enquiries by phone or online. The bus service in the Trelore Valley now connects all train stations and villages in the area. Especially for holidaymakers, there's a rover ticket which can be used at weekends and on national holidays and allows unlimited journeys on those days. The rover ticket provides great value for money and is now even cheaper than it was last year. 
An adult ticket costs five pounds fifty a day. Senior citizens can travel for four pounds fifty, and a family ticket for up to five people costs just twelve pounds. Tickets can be bought on the bus. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. At the centre of the Trelaw Estuary area is the historic riverside village of Calton. The main road comes into the village from the south, and for those of you who are arriving by bus, it turns left just before the bridge and stops in the layby on the left-hand side. From there, it's just a short walk to Calton's various attractions. If you're arriving by car, you have to leave it in the main car park. Go over the bridge and take the first turning on the right. Then go on until you come to the end of that road. It's the only place to park in Calton, but there's no charge. If you're interested in local history, there's a museum in Calton with farming, fishing, and household implements from the late 19th century. As you come in from the south, cross the river and go straight on the same road until you reach the end. Also, on the subject of history, you can go and see the old mill, which has recently been renovated and put back into use. Turn left before you come to the bridge, then go straight on, and then take the first turning on the right. This leads straight there. If you're interested in arts and crafts, there's a potter's studio where you can watch the artist at work. After crossing the bridge, turn left, and it's the second building on the left. Finally, when you feel in need of refreshments, there's a cafe opposite the old boathouse and a picnic area near the mill. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. What would you say, Mr. Murray, are the main reasons that so much of our wildlife will have died out by the end of the next few decades? Well, Tony, we can't, of course, rule out the effect of urbanisation due to the spread of population. But apart from that, I believe there are two reasons which, in a way, are like the opposite ends of a piece of string. If you tie a knot in that piece of string, you end up with a circle, and whichever way you go round, it's going to turn out to be the same. I don't think I quite get that, Mr. Murray. Well, let's put it another way. It's rather like a film. You've got the good guys and the bad guys. They're pulling in opposite directions, but when it comes to the final showdown, it's hard to make out which is which. What are your two reasons, Mr. Murray? I call them greed and caring. Greed and caring. Yes, I know they don't seem to have much to do with one another, but think about it. The motive of greed is pretty obvious. In the course of the next few months, thousands of baby seals will be bludgeoned to death before they're even weaned from their mothers. What for? For the sale of their skins at inflated prices to please the vanity of a few, and line the pockets of the killers. Crocodiles will be slaughtered to provide shoes and handbags for the rich. Gorillas, tigers, leopards, and rhinos will be hunted for senseless sport, or poached in defiance of regulations. Their skins, their horns, and their magnificent heads will be used as trophies to decorate someone's living room floor or walls. That's terrible. Yes, but it's not all. The whale, probably the most impressive and certainly one of the most intelligent sea mammals in creation, will be cruelly hunted and harpooned to make more money for the profiteers. The dolphin, the sailor's friend, will be indiscriminately battered to death, at so much a head on the grounds that it is taking away the livelihood of a few fishermen by consuming the fish in its natural habitat. But surely, Mr. Murray. We do have to keep warm. We need whale oil and ambergris. Fishermen have to make a living. Part of what you say is true, of course, Tony. But we shall have to enforce far stricter controls if future generations are not to find themselves in a world devoid of wildlife as we know it. 
Well, I see what you mean about fur coats and crocodile handbags, Mr. Murray, but I don't understand what you mean by caring. That can't be bad, surely. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be living in a caring society. Well, so we do, in a way. The trouble is, there are so many well intentioned people who start out with the best possible motives of trying to protect or immunize us from this, that, or the other in the most effective way at the quickest possible rate, but in their enthusiasm they lose sight of the long term consequences. It's only very gradually that the danger to other forms of life, including humans, comes out, not to say leaks out. And by that time, it'll probably be too late to do much about it. Take insecticides, for instance. But insect. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. But insecticides protect crops from pets. They destroy disease carrying mites and creepy crawlies like cockroaches. True, but nature has a way of developing her own immunity against insecticides and other pest controls, with the result that the biologists are driven to inventing stronger and stronger compounds, which, though they may annihilate the pest, nevertheless permeate the environment, are assimilated by plant and animal life, and become absorbed by the soil. Countless innocent creatures, the beaver or the mole, for example, are performing a useful task in the natural control. The alarming prospect is that as these poisons enter the foods we eat, and consequently our own systems, they'll find their way into the body of the pregnant mother and into her milk, offering incalculable risks to the unborn or newly born infant. In spite of all our technological expertise, our time is running out. We're virtually destroying ourselves. Thousands of exotic plants and animals have been introduced into the British Isles over thousands of years. These newcomers compete with native species for resources and can also cause major changes in the wildlife and in the habitats of our countryside. The problem is not just British, of course, but global, and it has been going on for centuries. One good example of this I'd like to mention today is the European starling. The starling to us in the UK is a fairly ordinary little bird, about 12 inches long. In flight, it appears to be black or grey with tiny white spots. So it's a very ordinary looking, almost dirty looking bird. It nests in trees and buildings and can be found in the country and in towns. It travels in large flocks, leaving the nests in the morning and returning in the early evening. It feeds on insects and fruit. Its native range includes the British Isles and Finland, but it is also found in most of Europe and parts of Asia and Africa. In the British Isles and Finland, however, it has suffered a huge decline, and in these countries there is an effort to conserve the species. It is a different story in some of the places where it has been introduced. For example, the population in the USA is estimated at 170 million birds. Also, they are becoming a big problem in Australia and New Zealand. Starlings, as I have said, nest in trees, and it has been found that they are more aggressive than native species, native that is to Australia and New Zealand, when they are looking for nesting places. They therefore compete with native species for nests, and also they drive those species away from nests. So, this nest building activity causes harm to native species, but also they are a nuisance to humans. They gather in large flocks of thousands of birds and feed together on commercial crops. This causes great financial damage to farmers. And they also make a mess, both in the town and the countryside. There is also the problem that starlings may carry diseases which affect both humans and other animals, although this has not been really confirmed and we are waiting for more work to be done on this. The question arises, what are we to do about foreign species which not only do damage to native species but interfere with human activity? We have three approaches in theory, but usually it is not a free choice between them. Usually we have to do the best we can and that money will allow. 
The best approach, of course, is prevention, and many countries have passed legislation which attempts to limit or prevent the arrival of non-native species in their countries. In particular, there are many international regulations on how and where ships may pick up and deposit water, and this is a major contribution to preventing the accidental transport of fish and organisms by ship. Since accidental transport by ship is a frequent cause of fish and other creatures going from place to place, ports also have special areas where water can be deposited, and many of them have treatment facilities to kill any foreign species that may establish themselves in their waters. For fish and organisms that live in water, these international regulations are useful, but obviously not all species can be dealt with in this way. Sometimes it is simply too late for prevention. Then we have to consider eradication or management. By management, I mean that we have to decide how best to live with the new creatures and how to keep their numbers down. However, this becomes not only a scientific question; it can be a matter of choice what population level of an invasive species we want to maintain. This choice involves costs. There is the cost of living with the species, and there is the cost of managing the species over time. And species management is usually a long-term business without any foreseeable end. However, there is not just the economic aspect to this question. We can also consider the ethical point. How should we treat animals which we have sometimes deliberately introduced into the environment? Is it permissible just to exterminate a number of them convenient to ourselves? The most important decision has to be made in the political forum. Whatever considerations go into the making of that decision, these questions are relevant also to the approach of eradication, which is another option, but which does not have an encouraging history. Many attempts have been made to eradicate introduced species.